And I don't think it's accidental or incidental here that actually, as you read through that story, they are contrasted with some other people. Did you see that in the story? Because the, the Magi, they come to Jerusalem, don't they? Who do they talk to in Jerusalem? They talk to the king. Who does the king call? He calls all of his wise men, as it were, the leaders, the religious leaders in the country. And I think they're, hold in, they're held in contrast with the wise men who come from afar, these two groups of wise men. These wise men in Jerusalem, these religious leaders, who had to hand all the information, libraries of books, all the material you could hope for about this Messiah, and they're local. They're supposed to be waiting and watching for his arrival, like on the edge of their seats, waiting for him to come. And yet, with the news of his arrival, they take no further action. They do nothing. They appear not to even believe it. That's the, the appearances. They appear not to even give any weight to their own prophecies, really. These men that have come from a long way away, all they've got to go on, as far as we know, all Matthew tells us is they've seen a star. That's it. They've just looked at the creation around them. That was enough to set them on their journey, to make them want to come and find out more about this king. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Will you or will I be like the wise men? It's the first challenge I want to give you this morning. Are you someone who just knows a lot about Jesus? You know, if you had a Bible trivia quiz, you could, you could win. Yeah, You can answer all the questions. You know that the answer to most of them is Jesus, admittedly. And you know where to go for the books to open to find out the answers to questions. You know all of that stuff. But are you one of these that will still keep your distance despite knowing all of that? Or will you be like the wise men who put down those books just for a moment, forget about all the facts and the figures and actually seek him, actually go and bow down before him? There used to be a, um, a craze for bumper stickers i think it's an american th thing isn't it bumper stickers but it, it came over here for a little while i think uh, in like the 80s and 90s uh, and, and i think we we then switched over to putting signposts out of church uh, outside churches uh, and some of them were pretty cringy but there were a few good ones there was one you used to see a fair bit it just said it said a lot with very few words it said this wise men still seek him and it's available at a reduced price if you want to get one of those uh, for your bumper. But it's, it's, it's good, isn't it? Why, will you be wise? That's the first question this morning. Will you be like the wise men and actually seek him? Actually seek him. We're going to sing uh, a kid's song before we, before we look a little bit more at this story. So we're going to sing King of Christmas. I think, is it just you, is it, Ruth? On your own? Are you doing the actions and playing the guitar? Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> hopefully. I'm relying on your memory. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, a lot of fuss is made about the gifts that the wise. I mean, that's the way you probably thought the sermon was going, didn't you? The three gifts. I mean, it's brilliant that there's three gifts because all good sermons have three points, don't they? But are those gifts supposed to be symbolic? Are they supposed to point us in a particular direction? scholars are divided but they always are divided about almost anything when you read about it some suggest that we're supposed to read nothing more into these gifts other than that it was just god's provision some very valuable gifts paid for a very probably expensive journey that they had to make as they fled uh, to egypt the, fam the family had to had to run away uh, and actually they would point out that it was common practice to just give these sorts of gifts to a dignitary or to uh, an important person, especially to royalty. So it could be that these gifts are just an expression of the, you know, the high honour in which these wise men from afar held this baby. We don't know for sure. But a lot of people do see a bit more here. And the gifts, I mean, these gifts are rather suggestive, aren't they? I suspect you've all heard talks on these. Let's just have a look at them briefly then. The first one is... Gold, isn't it? Now, gold is an obvious symbol of royalty. It's not a leap, really, is it? Sort of think gold and royal and wealth, that sort of thing. Gold is gift fit for a king. 
Now, we already know that these wise men, they've already said it, haven't they? They have discerned that what that star means that they've seen is that there's been a baby who is born king of the Jews. That's what they've come looking for. That's why they go to a palace, isn't it, in Jerusalem? And yet they themselves, this is the interesting thing, king of the Jews, and yet they themselves, probably somewhere over in Iraq or somewhere like that, they have felt compelled to come from foreign lands to worship this king. Despite the ordinary appearance of this child, yes, yeah, just a baby, just despite the ordinary surroundings, I guess just an ordinary house in an ordinary village, they knew, despite all of that, that this was in fact a king so great that, that, that the heavens had done something to announce his arrival. A king so great that they must come from far away and bow the knee to him. Gold from far off nations. Well, it suggests, doesn't it, that this is a king who is a king over all, actually. And that the first response that we should have when realising that, that a king over all has come, is to bow the knee also. That's what wisdom dictates. Well, what does it mean to bow your knee to Jesus? What does that mean? Well, it means to give him first place. To put the crown on God's head is to give him first place. To recognise that he is more important than we are, that he is more important than anybody else is, and to acknowledge then that what he says, and we've got it here, haven't we? What he says is more important than any other voice that you might hear talking to you. More important, his voice comes first. He is the one that we need to listen to and obey. All of that from gold, yeah? He's the one you need to listen to and to obey. He's the person that a wise man will, wise child, wise woman would respond to. Well, the second gift, what's the second one? Gold and then frankincense. We all get them in the right order, don't we? Because we just, we know, don't we? Frankincense. Yeah? Not Frankenstein. Who said Frankenstein? <laughs> frankincense. Well, frankincense was this fragrant resin. You see it there? Uh, it was usually in the sort of solid form that you find there in that picture. And it was used in temples all over the ancient Near East. It was burned as an incense in temples particularly. And it was actually one of the ingredients that was used to make the incense used in the tent of meeting, in, in the temple itself, the holy place in the temple, where God said he would meet with his people. It's that place of meeting. This was the incense burned in the place where God met with his people. It's been taken then as a symbol of the fact that this baby, this child would take a priestly role. He would be our great high priest who not only meets with God on our behalf, but actually, ultimately, brings us with him into the presence of God. And here's the point then I want you to think about with the frankincense. The frankincense is telling us there is no other way. You cannot skirt around Jesus and find another way to God. You can't do it through just, you know, good works or efforts or, or religious effort that you make. They are not, you know, and they're, they're, they're not going to work. There are not many paths that go up that same mountain to God. There's only one way, frankincense is telling us. And that way, Jesus became flesh and entered our world on a mission to bring us to God, to be that priest for us. So the frankincense then can remind us that Jesus, only Jesus can bring us to God so that our friendship is restored with him. So that relationship between God and mankind is re-established. He's our priest. Gold, frankincense. Third thing. What was what's the third one? Gold and frankincense and <coughs> myrrh. Excellent. Well done. The myrrh reminds us, the myrrh reminds us of how. How? How can Jesus bring us to God? How is it possible? Well, myrrh was another, you can see it looks a little bit like frankincense, it was another fragrant balm that was used in perfumes. But it's telling, I think, 
Do you know, the only other times frankincense is mentioned, actually pretty much in the New Testament, certainly in the Gospels, it's only mentioned a couple of other times. And they're both to do with the death of Jesus. They both come right at the end of the story. First of all, it's offered to Jesus when he's on the cross. It's been mixed with cheap wine and some kind of a sedative given to Jesus to dull the pain of the cross. And Jesus refuses to drink it because Jesus has come to suffer in full for your sin and for my sin. That's what he came to deal with. And myrrh is then used one further time. It's provided later that same day when Jesus is taken down from the cross. Nicodemus brings some of it to use in preparing Jesus' body for burial. That's what myrrh was used for. So I don't think it's a stretch to suggest that the myrrh is supposed to point us to the death of Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's a bittersweet reminder that that precious new life, that little baby, was destined for the cross. It ties the beginning of his story in with the end of his story. That's what myrrh does. I think Matthew does that quite a lot. He has it at the beginning of his story. He has it at the end of his story. Just like, actually, when you think about it, the phrase king of the Jews, only used twice in Matthew's gospel, when the wise men come looking for the king of the Jews, and then it's nailed to the cross above Jesus' head. This is the king of the Jews. Our sin, all the bad things that we do, all the good things we don't do as well, all the bad things we think and say, those things drive that great big wedge between us and God. They open a gap between us. Because he is holy and spotless. How can we come to him? The only way to come to him is Jesus, who has brought us back into friendship with God by giving his life to pay for all of those things that we've done or not done. Gold, will you bow to him as king of you? That's the first thing. Frankincense, will you come to him as the only way to God? And thirdly, myrrh, will you trust in the one who gave his life for you? Great reminders, aren't they? Great pointers. Brilliant. We've got some cracking carols this morning, haven't we? It's been very, very good. One last short thought just to finish us off this morning, okay? Going back to this passage. As we finish our time together... And we return back to our homes to enjoy all the gifts that we've received today. Those wise men that we're looking at here this morning, they remind us that God sent his son to be the saviour, to be the king of everyone. And that the right way, the wise way to respond is to, like them, bow the knee and to trust him. To trust him with life and eternity. But let me just close with this final thought. See, Christmas is not about only what we need to give to him. It's about what God has given to us. What we give to him actually really does pale in comparison to what he has given to us. The Apostle John wrote this. We'll pop it up on the screen. Just a short sentence. He said this, we love him, well, we love, generally, we love, we love him because he first loved us. That's what we see, actually, in that baby in the manger in Bethlehem, isn't it? Him loving us first. Everything that we might want to give to Jesus is because of the gift that we ourselves have received in him. He's given us more than our minds can grasp, you know. Think about these things, okay? Sometimes we gloss over them. Think about the idea of being given complete forgiveness, not just of everything that's gone past, but of everything that's to come. Can you get your head around that? That God in Jesus has forgiven you of things you haven't even done yet. That's phenomenal. That's something we can't get our heads around. Eternal life, life that goes on and on and on forever. We can't even grasp the concept of forever, can we? An inheritance that cannot perish, spoil, or fade. I mean, what's that? Everything in this world wears out, rots, moulds, perishes, or is stolen. Everything. 
Those are all things that we can't even picture in our minds. They're so big that they go beyond the known to the unknown. Huge, unknownly huge gifts that God gives us. And I don't know what you think of what heaven is like. Perhaps for some of you, you think of heaven as being like... I mean, we had a lovely morning yesterday. We went out for a walk in the sunshine. Perhaps for some of you, it's a warm day, walking in beautiful sunshine, just seeing the glory of creation all around you. You think, that's just heavenly. That's what it'll be like. And then there'll be others of you that just think, you know, a, a darkened room with a, you know, with a games console uh, and a constant supply of snacks. And, and, and you just can't think of anything better than that. You know, whatever floats your boat. But I want to put it to you that actually, even if those things don't exist in heaven or in the new creation, it's a better way of thinking about it, even if they do exist there, they will mean nothing to us compared to seeing Jesus face to face and being in his presence. That's hard to get our heads around, isn't it? It's hard to, to, to really realise that. But the ultimate gift of, Chris, of Christmas is that he gives us himself. He gives us himself better than any of those gifts. I'm not sure our minds can really grasp that. But that is the ultimate gift of Christmas. We cannot outgive God. He is the giver and the, the maker, the creator of everything. And Jesus Christ has given himself for us. So let's end this this year, let's end this service by coming to him and looking more and more at the beauty and the awesomeness of our Saviour. Why don't we start doing that? Um, let's start doing that by singing our final song, actually, this morning. But that's what we want to be doing this Christmas, don't we? We want our hearts really to long for him, to, to really recognise the wondrous gift that Jesus himself is for us. Right, we're going to sing this last song. Uh, it's another absolutely smashing carol. We're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful, and we're going to respond with our hearts now. If you'll stand, well, I'm going to. I'm inviting you to as well. Stand up and let's sing this when the music starts.